Good morning and welcome to the next lecture in our class on chemical engineering principles of CVD process. In the last lecture, we started dealing with a specific illustration of CVD where we were looking at tungsten filament bulbs and the process involved in the blackening of the bulb due to deposition of tungsten from the filament. Again, the, the history of tungsten filament bulbs changed from PVD to CVD because initially we were just burning carbon filaments which had a very high evaporation rate. So the bulbs would get black within days and you couldn't use them anymore. Then we started using tungsten filaments which um, burnt with a lower evaporation rate. So it extended the lifetime but still we were looking at weeks of lifetime. So the next advancement was actually filling the bulb with an inert gas which uh, slowed down the rate at which the deposition happened uh, and extended the lifetime again to months instead of weeks but still a very finite lifetime and all involving essentially physical vapor deposition because tungsten was carbon or tungsten was evaporating from the filament and depositing as carbon or tungsten on the bulb wall. So the major advancement in the lighting industry which was actually pioneered by General Electric was to fill the bulb with um, halogen gases. When you do that you produce a reactive environment and you set up a CVD process in which the tungsten that is deposited onto the bulb wall reacts with the halogen that is inside the bulb to produce a halide molecule in the vapor phase which cycles back to the filament. So essentially you set up something called the halogen cycle where you are constantly forming a tungsten halide at the bulb wall which is decomposing into tungsten at the filament. So if you set up the cycle properly um, conceptually it is possible to design a bulb with infinite lifetime. The rate at which tungsten is evaporating from the, from the filament can be exactly balanced by the rate at which it is redepositing onto the filament. And the point I made in the last class is the industry has actually reached this stage of almost perfect design in that bulbs today do not fail for simply blackening. The, what they fail for is the filament actually snapping. Of course, when that happens you get this huge spurt of tungsten which deposits on the bulb and makes it very, very black. But um, the sustained and continuous evaporation and deposition of tungsten on the walls of the bulb has pretty much been eliminated in the lighting industry now. So it is a great advancement from a technology viewpoint where it is a very interesting application of CVD technology because you are relying upon vapor phase reactions to convert the uh, depositing element into various species in the gas phase which have different migratory paths. The uh, tungsten species in the gas phase goes from the filament to the bulb but the tungsten halide species in the gas phase goes from the bulb to the filament and it is a balance between these two that gives you the no blackening condition. Um, we then started doing the, the transport analysis of the system and uh, the simplest way to model it is um, where we model the entire enclosure of the bulb as a stagnant layer and this is called the Langmuir layer which, which can extend all the way from the filament to the wall of the bulb. And by definition in a, in a Langmuir layer the transport only occurs by diffusion or conduction. There is no convection process involved. So under that simplifying assumption you can write the, the, um, the heat transfer equation as divergence of Q dot double prime equals 0. where again Q dot double prime stands for heat transfer per unit area per unit time. The dot stands for per unit time, the double prime stands for per, per unit area. So it essentially represents a flux basically saying that in a stagnant Langmuir layer the uh, heat, the divergence of the heat transfer flux equals 0. Of course if you are talking about a simple, of course Q dot double prime can be written as minus K gradient in temperature. And in, in the simple radial transport situation you can write this as D by DR of minus K DT by DR equal to 0 and solve for the 
temperature distribution inside the bulb. And similarly, you can write an equation for the diffusive flux of tungsten from the filament to the bulb and that will you will then write it as divergence of j w dot double prime equal to 0 where this is the diffusive flux of tungsten towards the wall of the bulb and j w dot double prime can then be written as minus d w rho gradient in omega w which is the Fick diffusion form of the, the flux equation for mass plus there is a thermal contributed to this. So, you write that as plus omega w alpha w t times um, ln t over t sorry uh, d t by t. or d l n t and this is um, represents the thermal diffusion portion because mass transfer can happen not only by mass diffusion but also by thermal diffusion when there is a temperature gradient that can also drive mass transport. So the um, and, and again this is for the simple case of a tungsten filament bulb with inert gas filling so there are no chemical reactions this is essentially a pvd process and it says there is a a temperature distribution that's set up inside the bulb and there is an associated diffusive flux of tungsten and it's all one way there is nothing to bring the tungsten back to the filament so there is a finite rate of mass loss from the filament which keeps happening till the filament becomes too thin okay, at which stage it snaps or so much tungsten deposits on the bulb wall the light does not come out right those are the failure modes in this lamp. Now the halogen cycle lamp is where you have a tungsten filament bulb with halogen cycle. So in this case you have set up chemical reactions as soon as you introduce a reactive species into the bulb you start forming various chemical compounds due to chemical reactions it is not inert anymore which means that your mass transfer equation cannot be written as j i divergence of j i w equal to 0 instead you have to write it as divergence of j i w dot double prime equals r i dot double prime where um, the diffusional flux of species i that the divergence of that must now be balanced by the rate at which that species i is reacting. So, you have to write this for all i which are all the chemical species that are present in the system and you have to write this j. So, this is for any i j i dot double prime and that is equal to minus rho d i gradient in species i plus omega i alpha i t times d t by t. So, this is the generalized form of the species diffusion equation in the case of a reactive environment. Now the problem is while this can be solved analytically and there are actually literature solutions available for this particular case that case is a lot more complex because we do not know this. As I have said before when you have a highly reactive environment and you have multiple elements present the number of chemical species that can form are literally in the hundreds and the number of chemical reactions that can happen are also in the hundreds. So, how do you specify this r i dot double prime for every species you have to know every chemical reaction it is involved in you have to know every chemical reaction that produces that species and every chemical reaction that consumes that species and you have to obtain a net reaction rate it is not doable I mean you can approximate it and in fact what people have done in the past is to try and represent 
the, the dominant chemical reactions by a series of maybe 10 reactions or so and assume that that completely describes the chemically reactive environment inside the bulb. But that is unnecessarily restrictive and you could make significant errors by taking that approach. So the latest iteration of this is to come up with a smarter way of doing this modeling, right. So supposing we want to use this methodology for a chemically reactive environment, how would you do that? Is there a shortcut that you can think of which will enable us to do that? What is it in a chemically reactive environment that behaves like a chemical species in a non-reactive environment? The chemical element because the element in even in a reactive environment cannot be generated or consumed unless it is a radioactive element and I hope that we do not have any radioactive species in our bulbs. So if you rewrite these equations in terms of elements in this case you can go back to that form. So for the same case of a tungsten filament bulb with halogens inside the bulb you can now write this as divergence of j k dot double prime equal to 0 for all k where k represents the elements that are present in the system. So for example in the case of the tungsten filament bulb if your halogen that you have introduced inside is let us say hydrogen bromide and your filament is tungsten then there are only 3 elements in the system tungsten, hydrogen and bromine. The number of chemical species can be many many depending on the various reactions that take place but the number of elements is only 3 and these elements are conserved they are not there is no reaction term there is no net reaction term. And similarly you can substitute this expression with j k dot double prime equals minus rho d k times gradient in omega k plus omega k alpha k where now this is the corresponding diffusional flux of the kth element. D of k is the diffusivity of the kth element. Now that is not a real quantity right because elements do not diffuse. Elements are contained in species that are diffusing but because of that you can obtain a net effective diffusivity of the element which is a weighted sum of the diffusivities of the species containing that element. Uh, and similarly for alpha kt the thermophoretic diffusivity of the kth element is actually a fictitious number but it represents the effective thermal diffusivity of the kth element. And for example you can write d of k the effective diffusivity of the kth element as being equal to summation over i of omega k i times d i times gradient in omega i divided by summation over i of omega k i gradient in omega i where omega k i is the mass fraction of the kth element in the ith species. d i is the fixed diffusivity of the ith species and gradient in omega i is the gradient in the mass fraction of the ith species. So you take this sum and divide it by the sum of omega k i times gradient of omega i that will yield an effective diffusivity, thick diffusivity of the kth element. So back into the, this term, so we know how to define d of k, we know how to define omega of k. Omega of k times, by the way omega k will be summation over i of omega k i, it is the total mass fraction of the kth element in the system. And then alpha k t the thermophoretic 
diffusivity of element k can similarly be obtained by summation over i of omega k i omega i alpha t i divided by summation over i omega k i omega i. So, you can estimate the effective Fick diffusivity and thermal diffusivity of the of the kth element and substitute those into those equations and you can now obtain the um, diffusion flux of the kth element. Now that is very important because in a CVD environment of a halogen cycle lamp what you really care about is is that going to be tungsten deposition happening or not. So what you want to estimate is this quantity J W which is the effective diffusional flux of tungsten element not tungsten species. Again you had to be clear in your mind about the difference between the two in a tungsten lamp tungsten species is only one species which is tungsten in the gas phase. Tungsten element can be contained in a hundred species that contain tungsten as, as an element. So what we are talking about here is the diffusivity of tungsten as an element which occurs because of the diffusion of various species containing that element tungsten. If this um, diffusivity is greater than 0 this implies that the bulb will blacken that is if there is a net deposition flux of tungsten element towards the wall of the bulb then it will form a film on the surface and the bulb will start blackening. If this is equal to 0 then there is no bulb blackening so the bulb will remain clear. If this is less than 0 the transport will actually be reversed and tungsten will now start accumulating on the filament. Now that is a little unlikely to happen because the, um, the equilibrium is set up so that the transfer I mean the bulk of the tungsten is in the filament right. So it is much more likely that the flux will happen from the filament towards the bulb rather than the other way around but theoretically it is possible for the diffusive flux of tungsten element to be negative towards the filament. But what the ideal situation that we want to look for is this we want to set up the conditions of the bulb in such a way that for a very long period of time the net flux of tungsten towards the wall is 0 or negative. So how do you do that? The fill gas uh, let us say you are using hydrogen bromide or uh, you are using oxy bromide you control the concentration of the fill gas so that the resulting distribution of species inside the bulb results in a net flux of 0 for tungsten element to the wall. So the, the fill conditions the nature of the gas the chemical composition of the gas the molecular weight of the gas all play a role in determining the fluxes mass fluxes that result in the bulb. Another parameter that you can have control over is the filament temperature. You want to run the filament temperature high in order to get maximum illumination but at the same time as you increase the filament temperature the rate of evaporation increases so the net amount of tungsten that is present in the bulb environment increases. So in that sense you want to arrive at an optimal filament temperature which maximizes the luminosity that it provides while minimizing tungsten loss due to evaporation. The other parameter that you have some control over is the pressure inside the bulb you know what is the the pressure at which you you fill the gases and seal the, the bulb. Now typically in the, in the old days there used to be vacuum but obviously that is a worst case because when you have a vacuum environment diffusion is greatly accelerated and the, and the filament will burn out very quickly 
So the more pressure you have inside the bulb, the slower will be the rate at which the tungsten molecules leave the filament and try to go to the um, walls of the bulb. But here again, there is a trade off. You know, you do not want to pressurize it so much that you know, the bulb will burst or the cost is very high. So there is an optimal pressure to be maintained inside the reactor so that you get the best characteristics of um, both filament life as well as process economics. Because the other critical parameter over which you probably do not have much control is the bulb temperature itself because that is going to be set by once you set the filament temperature and once you know what the outside temperature is, the bulb temperature will be some equilibrium between these two temperatures. So you really do not have um, much um, by way of uh, control over that. The other parameter that you do have some control over is the material of which the bulb is made. For example, you know most of these bulbs are glass right and glass has a certain surface energy. If you can for example um, make the bulbs of a lower surface energy material that can actually reduce the rate at which tungsten molecules deposit, it will essentially repel them. I mean in the, in, the, in the extreme case you can think about a bulb which has a coating inside which is an anti deposition coating which will actively repel these molecules and um, uh, push them away. So there are some parameters that you can try and control in order to um, maximize the rate uh, and maximize the lifetime of, uh, of the bulb. But the analysis essentially has been greatly simplified by restating the equations in terms of element properties rather than species properties and that is something you should remember when you are analyzing any CVD reaction system. If you try to do your analysis in terms of the chemical species, the, uh, the analysis will quickly become very complicated and there will be a lot of uncertainties and unknowns introduced because of the assumptions that you necessarily have to make about the various reactions that are taking place. On the other hand, if you restate it in terms of the chemical elements that are present, the fact that elements cannot be destroyed or created means that you can essentially um, simplify the analysis quite significantly and obtain analytical solutions in most cases. Now in terms of you know the, the operation of the bulb, the other major assumption that you have to make is whether or not you assume that chemical equilibrium prevails everywhere. We discussed this briefly in the last lecture. The filament temperature is very high, so it is very likely that you will be approaching chemical equilibrium at the filament and in the vicinity of the filament. On the other hand, the walls of the bulb are essentially at room temperature. So it is very unlikely that you will have equilibrium uh, prevailing at the bulb walls. So somewhere in between the nature of the problem changes from one which approaches thermochemical equilibrium to one that deviates significantly from it. So in terms of the essential analysis of this problem, what we have assumed here implicitly is that you have what is known as a chemically frozen layer. The assumption that is typically made in this type of a problem is if you have a bulb with a filament which is at temperature Tf and the bulb is at temperature Tb and by the way as I was mentioning in the last class, the electric bulb can actually be redesigned as a CVD reactor. The, this can be your source of the CVD material and this can be your substrate on which the material deposits. So think of an electric bulb as a CVD reactor, it is the simplest form, it is actually given a name, it is called a filament CVD reactor and the way that it works is exactly the way a bulb works, material is burning off of the filament in the middle that is at a high temperature and then it is depositing on the substrate that is around it. Um, so when you look at the situation, Tf and Tb uh, here because of the very high temperatures you can assume that local thermochemical equilibrium prevails. At the bulb walls even though the temperatures are low it is a heterogeneous situation. You have a solid surface that is coming in contact with the vapor species. In a heterogeneous case equilibrium is achieved 
much more easily compared to a homogeneous case. So, for the simplicity of analysis typically we would assume that chemical equilibrium also prevails at the walls of the bulb. So, in between between the filament and the bulb you have some flexibility in terms of what assumptions you make. You can assume that thermochemical equilibrium will prevail let us say up to half the distance from the filament after which kinetics will take over or you can assume that thermochemical equilibrium extends all the way to the bulb walls. You assume that it is a sufficiently high temperature that it is justifiable to assume thermochemical equilibrium everywhere inside the bulb that is another approach. A third approach is to say that you have thermochemical equilibrium here and at the bulb wall in between chemical reactions do not take place and that assumption is termed chemically frozen. When you say that the region is chemically frozen what it means is that chemical reactions are not allowed to take place and the species transport is completely controlled only by the diffusive phenomena that are present and there are no chemical reactions happening inside. Now obviously this assumption is not valid inside a bulb you know it is very hard to justify it. In fact the, the place where this is justified is in a in a, the next case that we will deal with which is a boundary layer on top of a substrate. In that case the boundary layer is thin enough that you can for the sake of simplifying the problem ignore chemical reactions that are taking place inside this boundary layer and only consider chemical reactions taking place on the substrate and at the outer edge of the boundary layer. But in the case of a, a, a reactive environment like a filament CVD reactor or an electric bulb the more common assumption is to assume that the local thermochemical equilibrium extends all the way to the bulb wall. The temperature distribution everywhere is such that you never deviate very far from thermochemical equilibrium which enables us then to use free energy minimization as the method once you know the temperature distribution you use um, uh, um, you know an algorithm that minimizes free energy to calculate the corresponding species compositions at every temperature and you use the species compositions to calculate the gradients and once you know the temperature gradients and once you know the concentration gradients you can then you can then proceed to calculate the diffusive flux of the species. The, it is an iterative process in the sense that they have to be self consistent. The temperature distribution that you obtain must be consistent with the elemental distribution that you obtain in the in the bulb. So, essentially you have to set up a loop where the two equations the energy equation and the mass conservation equation are solved simultaneously in order to obtain a self consistent solution. Now in terms of the lighting industry how is this used? Well um, one way is that you set the design windows basically you decide on what is going to be your temperature you know filament temperature what is going to be your pressure and what is going to be your fill gas concentrations based on um, these types of analysis and in fact the way you would do this is to draw essentially dew point diagrams. So for example on the x axis you can um, draw the P of um, let us say HBr the partial pressure of hydrogen bromide which is one of your fill gases and on the vertical axis you can draw let us say you, you use Tf the filament temperature as the parameter. You will then map out a window which we call the zero element flux window ZEF window. If you are if this combination of variables is in here then you know that JW is equal to 0 whereas if you are outside this window then JW is greater than 0. 
So you, you try to identify these operational windows and you select conditions for your bulb such that you are always inside this window of um, zero element flux. Of course the you know this is a very deterministic view but there are uncertainties. So when we talk about this window the boundaries have certain error associated with them but hopefully if you have a good thermochemical database that contains the properties of all the species that are involved this uncertainty in the boundaries of this window can be kept to something as low as let us say 10 percent okay. Then this becomes a very useful design tool. for designing um, a bulb which has an extended lifetime. Another thing that you have to be aware of are the parametric sensitivities. For example, let us say that um, this in this particular case your, your carrier gas or fill gas may be argon right because the HBr or the halogen is only introduced in trace amounts. It cannot be used as the fill gas because it will be just too reactive. So typically you use something like an inert gas as the primary gas to reduce to slow down the evaporation process and then you use something like HBr or HOBr as your trace gas to produce uh, the re reactivity that you need. But supposing now you change from argon to let us say krypton, what would happen? Will that shrink the window, will it expand the window or will it make no difference? Any speculation on that? Suppose you have a tungsten filament bulb and let us say you are using argon as the fill gas and then you change to krypton, what do you think will happen? It will expand the window. Why? Because krypton is a heavier gas. Exactly. So it will slow down the diffusion process. So you can operate in a wider window uh, by using a heavier inert gas but more expensive, right. So again there may be cost uh, economics that need to be taken into account. But in general any species uh, or any change in the process which, which slows down the diffusion process will, will certainly help you. And similarly with the, with the fill gas, you know actually if you go from HBr let us say to hydrogen oxybromide, how do you think that will change things? Will it again expand or shrink or because this is a little more complicated because this obviously has to do with the, with the reactivity of the species. Now when you use HOBr, it makes the system more reactive essentially. Now whether that is goodness or not, it is not easy to say a priori, but oxybromides are preferred over HBr. Can you think of a reason why we would prefer to use an oxybromide rather than a bromide? See one simple reason is that we always have some trace oxygen, you know even if you have HBr as your gas that you have intentionally filled in, there is always going to be some leakage of atmospheric oxygen into the bulb. By providing the oxygen as part of your reactant molecule, you have better control over it, right. So uh, that is one, one reason why it is preferred. The second reason is, see ultimately what, what you are trying to do is there is tungsten sitting on top of the bulb wall and you are trying to convert it into Wx. So a lot depends on how reactive that gas is with the tungsten that is coated on onto the bulb. Um, by having oxygen in the system, you provide more opportunities to react with the tungsten and convert it into a gas phase. So if you have W plus OX, You can now produce more species, you can produce tungsten oxybromide type of species, you can provide, you can produce WOX species and you can produce WX species. So 
there are more ways in which the solid tungsten film on the bulb wall can be um, converted into uh, gas phase species that can then diffuse back. In terms of diffusivities, as we discussed briefly in the last class, when you have, when you have the filament and the bulb, tungsten is diffusing this way and Wx or Wox is diffusing this way and the diffusivity scales with, scales inversely with size. So the diffusion rate of tungsten back to the filament is always slower than the diffusion rate of tungsten away from the filament and that is one reason why it is very unlikely that we will ever get a negative flux of tungsten. The, the tungsten flux will always be towards the bulb or 0. The best we can hope to achieve is 0. Now when you introduce oxygen into the system compared to Wx, Wox is going to be even slower because it is a an even larger molecule. So what are the implications of that? It essentially means that if Wox is the only species that is produced, it is actually going to shrink the window, right? Because it is going to slow down the, pro the rate at which tungsten diffuses back to the filament. So this window will tend to shrink. But because the presence of oxygen also allows the formation of Wox and of course Wx can still form, you are essentially negating that by providing more opportunities for tungsten to vaporize and get into the gas phase in the form of um, various species. So in general, oxybromides have found greater acceptance in the lighting industry compared to bromides. And by the way, the other species like chlorides and so on have also been used, but bromides are again considered optimal from the viewpoint of being able to uh, produce the gas, fill the gas and obtain very repeatable and reproducible results. So one of the problems with chlorine and fluorine, especially chlorine is that A, it is a, it's a corrosive material. So if you have impurities present in the bulb environment, you can actually start seeing some evidence of uh, chloride formation on the bulb wall. So in addition to forming tungsten, you may also start forming tungsten chloride type of deposits which, which you do not want. And secondly, um, because it is so reactive, it is very difficult to control it in a, in a sense. You, even small variations in the concentration of the chlorine at any one location can result in huge changes in the characteristics of uh, what you find uh, for the tungsten deposition. So there are a lot of interesting issues which have kind of resulted in the industry now predominantly using tungsten oxybromide as the reactive gas and argon as the uh, carrier gas. Um, of course, you can go the other way. I mean, for example, if you use helium, which is which was originally helium and neon were the species that were mostly used to fill the bulb, but you can clearly see that because helium is a very light gas, the diffusivities will be extremely high. So your the, the window of clean operation will shrink quite rapidly. Now, another way to look at this window is. So far we have been assuming as I said chemical equilibrium at the bulb. What if you relax that assumption and say that the reactions at the bulb will be kinetically constrained rather than going to equilibrium. What will that do to the, the window of zero flux? Will it make it smaller or bigger? When we say that something is kinetically constrained, what it means is the process is slowed down, right? So the process of formation of the tungsten film on the bulb surface will be slowed down when you have kinetic constraints. So this is kind of the, the worst case, if the local thermochemical equilibrium case. The same window can be significantly enlarged if you assume that it is kinetically 
limited. But in terms of design, you always want to provide a safety margin. So the design that assumes that every reaction will go to equilibrium will give you a, a significant safety factor. And that is the reason why for design purposes, people still continue to assume that the all chemical reactions will go to equilibrium even at the bulb surface temperature, even though in reality they are significantly slowed down by the fact that the bulb wall is close to room temperature. So I mean this is you know a multi billion dollar industry even today when uh, the fluorescent lamps are kind of taking over from incandescent lamps. The ability to distinguish your product from a competitor's one of the factors is how long does it last you know as a consumer that is the first thing we look at you know if I buy this bulb will it last me for one year or two years. Will this other bulb even though it is cheaper if it turns to burn out in a short at time I am sure the consumer awareness will build up around that and they will you know start stop buying it and start buying something more expensive from a competitor we all do that. And in fact the brand names like Philips, GE and so on have essentially built up consumer loyalty by focusing more on the lifetime of the bulb compared to just the purchase price. You can see a clear difference in how long a bulb from a, a branded manufacturer lasts compared to one from a non-branded manufacturer because I mean they have research teams working on this kind of stuff. GE has a research lab in Ohio which just focuses on lighting systems and one of the key parameters they look at obviously is how to extend the lifetime of their lighting products in general. So it is worth paying the price for the extra technology, the extra understanding that these manufacturers have. Okay, so we will stop at this stage and in the next lecture we will take up another example of where CVD plays a very uh, pivotal role in, uh, in real life. Any questions on what we have covered today? Okay, see you at the next class.